Well, good evening to each and every one of you who has joined us live for another uh, Truth and Transformation TNT Bible Study right here at the New Sunlight Baptist Church here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's so, <clears throat> so often a pleasure and a joy that I can do this, and I want to express my sincere thanks and gratitude for each and every one of our <clears throat> New Sunlight members, as well as those of you who aren't members of the church, but who are tuning in and participating and joining in this time of Bible study. And so, as always, I'm thankful for your presence, and I want to ask that you would not only simply uh, watch and listen, but that you would participate. You can do that by uh, subscribing. You can do that by uh, liking and sharing and sending this to your <clears throat> friends and family, who, whoever they may be. Uh, ultimately, go to our website, newsunlightbcla.org, and you can find that we are connected via YouTube, via Twitter, via Facebook, as well as uh, Instagram. And so we're live right now, as we, as we are every Wednesday at 6.30. And again, I'm grateful, sincerely thankful to each and every one of you. And we look forward now to getting into the Word of God on tonight. Uh, for those who don't know, we're journeying through the book of Jeremiah, the prophet in the Old Testament of God's Word. And on tonight, we're going to start chapter 3. And what I want to do is I want to review uh, what we touched on in chapter 2. Uh, because in chapter 2, we, we dealt with some heavy issues uh, centered all on the issue of sin. And so when we look at Jeremiah's uh, word, and I'm going to give you time to, to turn there if you're not already there, if you have your Bible or if you have your phone or your tablet, uh, meet me in the third chapter of Jeremiah at this time. And while you're getting there, I just want to review that in chapter 2, we, we, we see several symbols, if you will, metaphors, illustrations of Israel's sin. And so uh, you see things like the symbol of an adulterous spouse uh, who uh, displays infidelity. And so Israel's sin, their disloyalty toward God, is, is one that is described as, as a, an adulterous, uh, and it's, it's a, an act of infidelity. And then you have uh, a description uh, where the people of God uh, are described as having cracked cisterns that they they relied on sources of strength and power that were not of God, and therefore it was uh, futile. It was useless uh, to try to rely on unreliable sources. And then you see uh, descriptions like being slaves and being <clears throat> uh, stubborn beasts and having a contaminated vine and 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 having a, a filthiness attached to them that soap could not cleanse them of. And you see other things like uh, unruly children and disgraced thieves. And, and finally, you see the people of God in bondage. They were described uh, essentially as POWs who were in bondage to their own sinful decisions. And so <clears throat> we shift into chapter 3 tonight because what I want to do is we want to do a study, an analysis of divine judgment. We, we said last week when we introduced this, that we're going to take this in three parts, in three steps. And so tonight, uh, the essential desire of God is that he wants us back. When we look at what the record of the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 3, and even into chapter 4 as well, uh, we find out that God was essentially telling them that I want you back. And so we're going to look at the fact that, ironically, God in his judgment, in his willingness to correct and reprimand his people is also extending himself toward his people in mercy and grace and in love. But we have to deal with the heaviness of their judgment if we're going to deal with the gloriousness and, and, and the wonderful, amazing quality of his love. And so let's get into it on tonight. Jeremiah chapter 3, uh, I want us to first uh, look uh, in chapter 3 at verses uh, 1, 7, 12, 14, and 22. Again, uh, verses 1, 7, 12, 14, and 22. And what you'll find, if you look at those verses, is you'll find the word return. You'll find the word return in verses 1, 7, 12, 14, 22. You'll find either the word or the sentiment that there needs to be a return. And then even in chapter 4, the very first verse, 
you will also find the word or the expression about return. And so what we want to do is look at what does it mean uh, when the word of God uh, speaks about this return. What, what is God saying in chapter 3, verse 1, when he says, if a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? Or in verse 7, when it says, I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me. But she did not, and her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. If you go down to chapter uh, to uh, chapter three, still verse twelve, it says, "Return, faithless Israel," declares the Lord. I will frown on you no longer, for I am faithful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Verse fourteen says, "Return, faithless people," declares the Lord, for I am your husband, and I will choose you one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. And then if you go uh, to verse 22, it says, Return, faithless people. I will cure you of backsliding. Yes, we will come to you, for you are the Lord our God. And then finally, chapter 4, verse 1, If you, Israel, will return, then return to me, declares the Lord. If you put your detestable idols out of my sight, and no longer go astray. Now, several times we hear that word to return, to 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 come back, to to renew and restore this relationship, this fellowship. So we want to get into this confrontation that God's people encounter. There's a confrontation that God's people encounter on tonight <clears throat> that I want us to look at. Because when we look at this word return and how it's used several times, it's repeated. And what we find out is, first of all, that there's a need to return because defiance has created a distance between God and his people. In chapter 3, as it continues from chapter 2, in all of the symbols and metaphors of Israel's sin, we discover that what is being reinforced is that God is confronting the people with their sin. And he's in essence, through the prophet, through this record in Jeremiah, he's saying to us, as it was said to them, that a defiant disposition creates relational distance between God and his people. A, re a relational distance between God and his people. Now, isn't it ironic that we're... Isn't it amazing? It's, it's, it's providential that we're studying... The book of Jeremiah, it was something we had already uh, started doing, and we continue to do that even through this pandemic, and we wanted to trust that God would speak to us in ways that are relevant to our current circumstance. And isn't it amazing uh, and fascinating that in God's word on tonight that we're speaking about relational distance between God's people and God, and we are living in a time where we are required to exercise social distancing and that's why on Sundays if you tune into us live at 10 a.m. on Sundays I'm preaching from the theme what we learn from a distance because we we're trying to reassure everyone and reinforce and reaffirm that even if we feel like we're isolated from everyone else we still have a God who can intervene and step in to do what it is that is necessary on our behalf and so tonight we're looking at a people who had created distance between themselves and their God all because they were defiant. They were sinful. They were disobedient. And they were defiant. You see, it's one thing to be disobedient. It's another thing to be defiantly disobedient. I wish you would hear that. Again, I'm going to repeat that. It's one thing to be disobedient in life, to be disobedient to parents or to, to be uh, insubordinate to someone who's in authority over you. If you are a lower level employee and you are uh, required to show uh, a certain level of, of regard and respect for those who are given the task and responsibility for overseeing the project and you show insubordination, it's one thing to simply do that. It's another thing to do it defiantly because defiance means that you are bold and and brash, and you are you are audacious. You 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 are in in essence daring someone to to object to what you're doing, and that's sadly what Israel 
what Judah, the people of God, were involved in. They were defiant in the face of God. They, 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 they boldly disobeyed God. And so what that did was it created distance. And so that's why we hear God extending himself saying, return to me. It's a confrontation. I picked that word confrontation because sometimes in life, just as it was the case for them, it is also the case for the children of God. That you and I, as people of God, we sometimes have to be confronted by God. You see, a God is a God who comforts us, but he's also a God who at times has to confront us. And so he confronts us when we are defiantly distant from him. But then we look and we also understand that this relational distance led to infidelity in the form of idolatry. Again, in this context, what we discover is that the people of God were worshiping foreign gods. They had shrines set up. There were sacrifices being offered to foreign gods that have no power, no authority, no ability to intervene on behalf of God's people, have no true power, and yet they were being regarded and being esteemed and elevated and exalted in a way that was idolatrous, that there was rendered unto them worship and, and respect and reverence that was undeserving. And so what some of us do when we think of this word idolatry is we, we distance ourselves from it because we think, well, as long as I'm not worshiping a foreign god, as long as I'm not uh, chanting and doing chants and songs to, 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 uh, to other gods, then I'm not idolatrous. But the truth is, you don't have to sing songs or do chants or get a board or, or sit in a dark room to be idolatrous. You can be idolatrous if you allow anything or anyone to take precedence and, and to become a substitute in, in, the, in the space that God should occupy, which is it, the authority over your life. Anytime you and I allow anything or anyone to take that space, to occupy the space in our lives that should belong to God, which is the chief authority, the supreme ruler, redeemer, savior, deliverer, lover, comforter, but one who will confront us. When someone else takes that position in your life, then you have exercised and you have allowed someone to, to occupy a space they don't belong in. And so that's what they did. So they, their, their distance led to infidelity in the form of idolatry. But then I want you to also get this. Idolatry occurs, watch this, when Judah fails to learn from Israel's demise. Now, quick history lesson. If you're taking notes, write these verses down. 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17. That's chapter 17. And then chapter 21. 2 Kings chapter 17, chapter 21. And then 2 Chronicles chapters 33 through 36. Those are extra references you can go back and read because here's what happened. You have the northern kingdom, known as Israel. You have the southern kingdom, known as Judah. It's important historically, in biblical history, to understand that Israel, the northern tribes, okay, they suffered demise first in 722. The Assyrian nation came in and subjected Israel, who was sinful, disobedient, immature, did not listen, and therefore God reprimanded them, allowed them to be subjected by the Assyrian nation. But then in the sixth century, in, in the late 500s, what you also saw then was Judah sadly, the last couple of tribes who were God's people, the southern kingdom was now being subjected under Babylonian rule. And so what we have historically is a sequence in which Judah had the opportunity to witness what happened to Israel, and they didn't pay attention. And so, look at uh, verse 11. In chapter 3 of Jeremiah's book, verse 11, it says, The Lord said to me, Faithless Israel, 
is more righteous than unfaithful Judah. Why does it say that? Because Judah was considered the southern portion of God's people. They were the last group of people, the last portion, the last group, the last community that could demonstrate their faithfulness toward God. And they had the chance to watch Israel mess it up. It's almost like a younger sibling having the chance to watch their older sister or brother do it the wrong way and learn from their mistakes. Some of you out there are younger siblings. Or if you don't have siblings, you have older uh, cousins or you have uncles and, and aunts. And you are able, watch this, to learn from other people's experience. You didn't have to learn from experience because you learned from someone else's experience. But if you're like me, all of us at some point had to sadly learn from our own experience. Sometimes we made mistakes, and then sometimes we just flat out chose to do what we wanted to do and had to suffer the consequences because of it. And so in this case, that's what happens. Idolatry is being exercised and engaged in because Judah failed to learn from Israel's mistakes. So that's the confrontation. That's the, the, the way in which God confronted his people with their sin. But now I want to shift, because I want to look at verses 12 through 18, and I want us to consider tonight the compassion that God offers his people. God not only confronts his people, but he offers compassion toward his people. Look at verses 12 through 18 in Jeremiah chapter 3. It says, go proclaim this message toward the north. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I'll frown on you no longer, for I am faithful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Notice now, God is assuring, he's offering assurance, affirmation, a promise that his people, that they could be reassured that he would not maintain a disposition of anger toward them. He would not frown upon them. Now, when you look at that word in Hebrew, what it actually means, there's different layers. One layer, one, one shade of meaning, is that he would not uh, overwhelm them. He would not cast himself upon them. That he would not overwhelm them, cast himself upon them, allow the weight of his presence and his reprimand to overtake them to the point where they were destroyed. Another shade of meaning is that he would not hold a grudge with them. Can you imagine if God held a grudge with us because of our sin? And think about it. Because of his righteous character, he has the right to hold us accountable for our sin. And yet, in this text, he's telling the people, I will frown on you no longer that there will come a time where I will not stay angry forever. Because if you keep reading, he also goes on to say something that we often quote in churches, but here's the context. Verse 14, return faithless people, declares the Lord, for I'm your husband. I'll choose you. I'll bring you to Zion. Look at verse 15. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. Now, we often quote that passage, and understandably so, rightfully so, to affirm the importance and the significance of shepherds, under-shepherds, those who serve and minister as pastors and leaders in local churches, and that's accurate. But this is an amazing context because what it does is it highlights for us the context in which this verse must be understood, that God was judging his people but he was also reassuring them in the midst of that so that when we see that he says, I'll give you shepherds after my own heart, the shepherd is a representation of God's grace and mercy and love and compassion that he's extending toward us. So that, catch this, if you serve and lead in a church, whether you're a pastor, or you're an extension of the pastor as a deacon, as a minister, a trustee, 
as a Sunday school teacher, a youth director, this what this really says to all of us is we are instruments of God's grace, mercy, mercy, and compassion. Now you know why that should 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 make us shout and tremble? Because that tells us then what we say and do in church should always be viewed through the lens of knowing and understanding that we're extensions of God's grace, love, mercy, and compassion. Which means I can't be mean-spirited, arrogant, haughty, hypocritical, manipulative, nasty, judgmental. If God, who has the right to judge me, chooses to be compassionate, then who am I, as a human being, to stand as an, ex as an extension of God and then be judgmental and be mean-spirited and, and, and lack love and compassion? And so that's just something I want to slide in because that wasn't typed on my script, but I thought that it's so fitting, isn't it, that as extensions of God's grace and mercy and compassion, that's the context in which God sends shepherds and sends leaders and servants. And so, to bring it all together, God's compassion is shown. God chooses not to overwhelm us, not to destroy us, not to hold a grudge with us. Because, watch this, he cannot be God and cease to be faithful to his promise of restoring and renewing fellowship and harmony with his own people. He promised he would restore. And therefore, he reaffirms, I'm not going to always be angry. I'm not going to always be at odds with you. I'm showing you compassion. Because I would cease to be God if I did not fulfill my promise to be faithful. Well, let me hurry and move forward. Because I want to give, give us uh, time so that we're done in a, in a timely fashion that you can have this evening to enjoy with your families, but you can also have the evening to go back and, and, and read some of the references that I've given you. So that was Jeremiah 3, 12 through 18, the compassion God offers his people. We've dealt with the, the confrontation. We've dealt with the compassion. I now want to deal with the cure that is available for God's people. We've dealt with confrontation and compassion. Now we must deal with the cure that is available for God's people. Look with me then, if you take a second and, and get a big picture of this, there's several references I'm about to give you. Uh, one is Jeremiah 8 and 22, so write these down. Jeremiah 8 and 22, and Jeremiah 30 and 12. Jeremiah 8 and 22, chapter 8, verse 22, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 12, we see what we can call the sickness of sin. I want to do that really quickly. I want to go to chapter 8, verse 22. And I want to read that aloud for us because look at what it says. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Sin, friends and family, is a sickness. It's a sickness, it's an infection that no vaccine can inoculate us from. That the only spiritual treatment and cure for the sickness of sin is that we must acknowledge we're sick and that we need a physician and that we need God's grace and mercy by faith to be activated on our behalf. That's the only way we can deal with the sickness of sin. I'm, 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 I'm stressing this because what happens is we, and I, and I love how this ties into our current context, catch this. We're talking about the sickness of sin. What is often amazing and scary about sin is that we often, watch this, we can recognize symptoms sometimes and we can become fixated on symptoms and fail to address the root cause of the sin. What are we dealing with right now in this pandemic? What makes this uh, 
uh, a time that so many people are paranoid and panicked and, and scared. It's because we can transmit and transfer this disease asymptomatically. It means I could have COVID-19 right now and not know it. Now, what does that mean spiritually? I'm not suggesting that we are innocent because Romans and other parts of God's word su uh, suggest and actually state that God has given all of us, even those who have not surrendered their lives in faith and acknowledged his son, Jesus Christ, Paul and others talk about the fact that as human beings, as the created beings of God, we have what is known as a conscience. As a human being, God has put a moral compass within us that there's something inside of us that, that sort of says to us in different moments of our lives, okay, that's not quite right. We can, even if we don't know the Lord, you have not committed your life to Christ by faith, but there's something inside of you that, that allows you to navigate through life. And there's a moral compass on the inside. There's a conscience. There's, there's something that tugs at you. When you see someone, if you see someone being mistreated, being beat up, being jumped on, there's a part of you that, that, that will feel a certain way. That's called your conscience. So none of us are innocent. But here's what I am arguing. Some of us, if not many of us, can be oblivious to the depth of our sickness of sin. Because we get fixated on symptoms, we don't address the root cause, which is sin. So Jeremiah says we have to recognize the sickness of sin. And we have to be aware then of a dishonest diagnosis. Go to chapter 6, verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14. Here's what it says. Here's what it says. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. So there were false prophets who were attempting to preach a message that basically said what we're going through, being subjected, being under subjection in exile to the Babylonian nation, it's not going to be that bad. Peace, peace, everything's going to be all right. It was a false sense of peace. It's not that they could not have peace with God if they repented and renewed their, their fellowship, but that their false security, false sense of peace and security, is being confronted in that verse. So, Jeremiah 6 and 14, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 8, and Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11, they all talk about this false sense of peace or confidence that the wounds that result from their sickness of sin, that they could not be underestimated and minimized. So, a dishonest diagnosis is what we have to be aware of. What are we looking at on television every day? We're watching the federal government. We're watching national, state, and local uh, political officials and medical and scientific researchers and experts try to come together to offer the best, wisest, sound advice. And we often have conflicts, don't we? Because there are persons, and I don't have time to get into all of what I would normally say on a Sunday morning, but I'll just say this, that we are suffering right now because at times in a, the United States of America, we've suffered from misguided diagnosis. We have experts who've given us timelines, yet we have governors who, rather than reopen their state in a very careful, methodical, measured way, are doing it as if we can just turn on the light switch and irresponsibly re ingratiate ourselves back into a normal society without any regard for the risks that are involved. I'm grateful that we don't have that issue in Louisiana, but we have it in other places. And it's very dangerous and it's disheartening. So what we have to do, friends and family, is we have to be prayerful that despite diagnoses that don't always match up with the context, we have to be vigilant and, and prayerful. But there is a cure, and that's the bottom line of this is, regardless of what our faults, frailties, mistakes, 
that are made in decisions, whether it's in the political realm or the scientific and the medical realm. Our healthcare workers are working tirelessly, doctors, nurses, so we have to pray for them and applaud them. But despite all the, the facts, mistakes that are, that are taking place, our hope is that we have a cure for the spiritual sickness of sin. And we can trust that if God can handle sin, he can also handle COVID-19. And when he's ready, he will. He will use the gift of medicine, the gifts of science and research, and he'll enable us to utilize them at the right time, and he'll give us what we need. And we'll see a press conference one day with a treatment and a vaccine for the COVID-19. I really believe that. When it happens, we don't know. But it will happen. But it will happen when God decides it's time. And so finally, we have the confrontation God's people must encounter, the compassion that God offers us, the cure that is available, because finally, chapter 3, verse 22, you see the hope of healing. The hope of healing in, in chapter 3, verse 22, the hope of healing says, in verse 22 it says, return faithless people again, I will cure you of backsliding. I will cure you, that's the hope. That's the cure, right? So, confrontation, compassion, and the cure. But here's the final, consecration. Consecration is necessary for us, and here's why. In Jeremiah chapter four, go to chapter four right now. Look with me at verse four. Jeremiah four, just go right over to chapter four, same page in your Bible or the next page. Here's what it says. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. Circumcise yourselves. Circumcise your hearts. Now, that's the reference being made to write, the, write these verses down, Genesis 17, verses 9 through 14. Genesis 17, verses 9 through 14. Leviticus 12, verse 3. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. And then, of course, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. They reference what? The ritual of circumcision. Because circumcision is the Old Testament symbol of God's people setting themselves apart that the cutting of the skin on all the male children after they were born and when it was time to be circumcised the cutting away of the skin the cutting away the painful removal of the foreskin on the male child that was a physical painful representation of the cutting away of and removal of sin in the, in the spiritual condition of God's people. The physical ritual was never designed to take the place of the spiritual act. So the act of circumcision physically, if done with no spiritual act, nullifies and renders the physical act and makes it all be done in vain. One more time. If I don't circumcise my heart, then it does not matter that I've circumcised my skin, my body. So you can have a whole lot of people walk around who have been physically circumcised as they were in Israel, but God's challenge, Jeremiah's challenge is but if you have not repented of God, repented in your heart, you cannot stand before God with a circumcised body if you don't have a circumcised heart. So the ritual is referenced to highlight the necessity, and we're done, of a repentant heart. Circumcision has to happen in here. That's why whether you're male or female, you have to be circumcised in here right here, that your mind and heart and spirit, you have to remove pretense, anything that you want to 
put any put-ons, any masks, any makeup, anything that you want to camouflage and cover up, all that has to be cut away. That's what spiritual circumcision is, removing the mask, the makeup, the cologne, the deodorant. It's anything that stands as a cover-up. You've got to cut all that away, and you've got to stand before God and literally say, Father, I stretch my hands before thee. There is no other help that I know. And you have to put faith in Jesus Christ. And so, I want to say this in closing, that we are confronted by God. We experience God's compassion that he offers. We have a cure that is available. And we must consecrate ourselves, friends and family. That is necessary if we're going to be in right relationship and fellowship with God. Because God's saying, I want you back. You've backslidden, and I want you back. And so that's a word for someone who's given your life to Christ. You know God in a personal way. Tonight, I've come to tell you that God has not abandoned you. God has not neglected you or forgotten about you. He simply wants you back into right fellowship with him. He's allowed you to wander and stray. But in this time of social distancing, it's ironic. You can rededicate your life to the Lord by coming, drawing closer to him. Watch this. So that when you do re-enter the society in, a, in, in our new norm, whenever that is, wherever you are, that you'll be able to handle being in new relationships with others when your relationship on a vertical level is where it ought to be. Our horizontal relationships will never be what they ought to be if our vertical isn't right first. And so, and then finally, to those who don't know the Lord in a personal way, I offer you Jesus Christ tonight. I offer you the invitation. Put your faith in God's Son who came. We preach about it on Resurrection Sunday. I preach about it every Sunday. We teach about Him every Wednesday. Faith in God. Faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That is how we experience grace and mercy. And so just like God's people in the Old Testament had to put their trust in God, we have the privilege of being on the other side of the resurrection so that everything Jeremiah preached about, it was all pointing to the Savior, the Messiah, the fulfillment. The, the, he is the balm in Gilead, Jesus Christ. He is our cure for the sickness of sin. And so I pray tonight that you enjoyed this time of study. I pray that you uh, heard truth and that you indeed will be transformed. This is what TNT is all about. And so I certainly want again to invite you. New Sunlight, BCLA.org is where we are. We're located physically right here in Lake Charles, Louisiana on 515 BE Washington Avenue. To all of our friends and family of New Sunlight, Pastor loves you and I appreciate you. Please keep giving. Please keep investing. You are showing yourself faithful. You are literally enabling our church to keep our lights on and keep uh, our staff paid and to allow this church to be a light uh, in a dark time in our community. And so I thank you for that. Please keep doing it. And to all of our friends and family who aren't members, but you have participated, I invite you to come back again, not only next Wednesday at 630, but we invite you to be here on Sundays, as always, 10 a.m. We'll be in the pulpit, in the sanctuary. We'll go live for our virtual worship experience, what we learn from a distance. That's what we're preaching on Sundays and on Wednesdays. We're in this book of Jeremiah as we journey through Jeremiah in the study of God's word. Know that, again, I love you. I thank God for you. To all of our young people who did our weekly Zoom call with our youth director, and all of our young people, I'm so grateful for each and every one of you all, children, youth, families. But for each and every one of you, the pastor loves you. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. I look forward to being back on next Wednesday. And until then, I pray that God will keep you, strengthen you, be with your family, and that he would bless each and every one of your homes, wherever you are right now. God loves you. I do too. I'll see you next time.